Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. Many years ago, I made the challenge in my own preaching to deal with the subject of worship on a regular basis. Probably less than maybe once or twice a year to deal with the subject of worship. That's what we want to do so this morning. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9, Almost at the close of this book, almost at the close of the inspiration of the New Testament, a worship situation comes up. Beginning at verse 7 of Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. When I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, Worship God. You let that sink in just a little bit. And you realize what's going on here in the close of Revelation chapter 22, the New Testament. Interesting statements made. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. John was receiving this. And as he states it, the situation comes up in his own life. He said, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And to show you the in-depth and sincerity of this passage of Scripture, this angel stopped John in his tracks. He told John, said, Don't you worship me. See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of the brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of this book. What did he say? Worship God. What is the object of our worship. Surely we have known enough about the Bible. Surely we have preached the truth long enough to recognize that worship is not of some man or of some angel or of some other object. But here in this text it makes it clear. Worship God. Who are we to worship? This passage makes it clear. God is the object of our worship. You know what man has done through the ages? Hundreds of years ago, people would notice that if you turned over a board that had been laying there in the dirt, a little gray beetle-like insect, and you know what they would do? They'd worship that bug. No life under the board, and then sometime later, the bugs crawling under the board, they thought this was the beginning of life. They worshiped little gray hard shell bugs. 
Man has been tremendous in his object of worship. He has worshipped the cow. He has worshipped the animals, the owls. He's worshipped snakes. He has worshipped uh, monkeys. In our scripture reading this morning before the Bible study hour, in, <clears throat> it's quite evident that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, God's people of that day needed to be reminded and to be corrected along the line that it was not the object of their hands that they had made that was to be the worship objectivity. But it was to be God. Man has worshipped the sun. Ezekiel 8 verse 16 He's worshipped the moon, stars, the heavenly host, the constellations. Paul warned about worshipping angels in Colossians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. In the book of Revelation, you'll find many different places where it talks about those who worshipped the beast, the worship of Satan. You remember Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Satan tempted him to fall down and worship him. And what did Jesus say? He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. There's been ancestor worship. Different cultures worship their ancestors. There's been holy places. We gave an illustration last Sunday about the most sacred place. If we're not careful, we'll not rightly divide the word truth and we'll come up that there are certain places that are holy and they're easier to worship at those holy places than other places. You remember what Jesus told the woman at the well, John chapter 4. She thought that according to her traditions and her background, that they were to worship God in a certain mountain. And Jesus made it clear. He says, no, worship won't be here in this place, this mountain, in this city. It's not a holy place. I was in the meeting out in Idaho this past June. A local preacher took me about about a two, two and a half hour drive due north into the Sawtooth Mountains and I wasn't ready for what I was going to see. Didn't know the country, didn't know where we were going and didn't know what was going to be in my vision in a few minutes. And he stopped at this overlook and we got out of the car and I looked, my mouth fell wide open and I said, Wow, I'd never seen anything like that. Well, was that a holy place to worship God? Listen, let me make something very clear. You can worship God anywhere on the face of this earth. I don't care where it is. Jesus made it clear that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you're sitting in a magnificent church building and you're not worshiping in spirit and in truth, you might as well stay at home to bed. You can't worship God dependent upon a certain place, a certain building, a certain scene, uh, uh, some kind of a holy place. That's not the way it is. Worship is in accordance to in spirit and in truth. But for the time we have left, I'd like to talk about some things that I believe are very important. What are our attitudes about worshiping God? If we don't have the right attitude when we 
worship God, we're not going to be able to worship him. One of the reasons why, you know, people need to come to grips with the subject of worship. Worship is something that is done by the human personality that requires effort. It requires timing. It requires the proper spirit and the proper attitude. Let me give you some holy attitudes that the Bible gives toward the subject of worshiping God. In the Old Testament, in Psalms 122 at verse 1, notice how this psalm begins. I was glad. What? I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Think about that a minute. Some people have twisted that verse and have come up with the idea, I was sad when I had to go into the house of the Lord. Or I was mad when I went into the house of the Lord. This passage gives a tremendous attitude. I was glad to do it. A lot of people went home this past week the most traveled day in the day of the, uh, of the country of the United States of America. Where were people going? They were gladly going back home. Think about it when you come to the worship of the church. Are you glad? Are you happy? Do you look forward to it with great anticipa anticipation? In the scripture reading this morning, there was a passage that I, I really caught my mind. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. Here God was warning to these people about who they were worshiping. They were not to worship things that creep on the ground or the likeness of any fish at verse 18. But there was an attitude that had developed in these people in their false worship that I believe needs to turn, be turned around, and we may think about it ourselves. In verse 19 it says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. No, I don't believe that the Bible teaches that we're to wo worship the host of heaven, things that crawl on the earth, the sun, the solar sun, the moon, the stars. But there was something going on in the minds of these people as they were worshiping false gods and false images. And he uses the expression there, and I never had noticed it before, shouldest be driven to worship them. Brethren, I can't think very long about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. I can't think very long upon the greatness and the majesty of Jehovah God and not be driven to worship them. How can we come into the assembly of God's people, the church, and not, if we give it any thought at all, if we prepare our minds for worship, if we think about what we're going to do today and not come to the conclusion Oh, I want to worship 
I want to bow down before Jehovah God and give him the credit. Give him the blessing. Give him the praise because of what he has done to drive us to worship him. Because he has. What's our attitude toward the worship of the church? Jesus gave one that I think is quite interesting. In Matthew chapter 15 at verse 9, notice the way he words this. In verses 8 and 9 of Matthew 15, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Oh, there's several good ideas there. Jesus made it clear that drawing nigh unto God with our mouths and with our lips and our hearts not being in it is a very, very vain situation. To leave your heart after something else when you come to the assembly of God's people, the church, and to try to worship with your heart tied into something else and not God is one of the most foolish things you could possibly do. But another idea here, he said, in vain they do worship me. It's useless. It's a passing bu uh, bubble that bursts and is no count. He said, in vain do they worship me. Well, wh what's he talking about? He said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of me. You tell somebody that they don't have to do anything to be saved by the blood of Jesus, you just shot them a false doctrine. And Jesus says, in vain your worship is if you follow the doctrine of commandments. If you teach somebody that the actual body, the bread, and the fruit of the vine on the Lord's table actually becomes the literal body, flesh of Jesus, and the literal blood of Jesus, you know what you just did? You shot them a false doctrine. And Jesus says, your worship is in vain if you do so. That's not stretching it at all. That's what's involved. What is your attitude toward the worship of the church? Acts chapter 17, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill showed some attitudes of heart that need to be thought about in the worship of the church. Beginning at verse 22, Paul in the sermon on Mars Hill said, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious or religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, well, if not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said well we are the also the offspring of God for as much then as we are the offspring of God we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold 
or silver or stone graven by art and men's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You can't read a passage of scripture like that and not recognize that worship to God is something that has got to be guided by what God said about this subject. Is it possible that these people here who had built an altar and put the inscription on it to the unknown God, is it possible for those people who made allowances for some unknown God to have been worshiping ignorantly and not pleasing to God? That's exactly what was going on. And Paul was nice about it. Paul was straightforward about it. He made it crystal clear that even though they had made allowances for some God they didn't know anything about, they were ignorantly worshiping, and as far as we out of it was concerned, they weren't worshiping at all. Paul said, I take this opportunity to declare unto you the great God of this universe. And that's what Paul did. He taught them about the God of the universe, Jehovah God. The very offspring, human family is the offspring of God. Now there's some attitudes in this passage. Notice a couple of them. First of all, can you worship God in ignorance and still be all right? No. No, you can't. There are many people who worship in the cultures of Africa and China and Russia and in the depths of their, their, of their countries, and they're ignorantly worshiping. Is it getting through to God? No. Worship is not something you do in ignorance. God has in given us the instructions to worship, has done so from the foundation of the world. Cain and Abel knew exactly what they were supposed to do in worship because God had told them so. One did it, one did not do it. One was pleasing and the other was displeasing. God has always told the human family what he wants done to please him in worship. Those who do what God says do will please him. Those who do not do what God says do will not please him. Another attitude. Come to grips with this one. This is serious. Do you realize what Paul says here in this sermon on Mars Hill? You need to think about this when you come to the worship of the church. You know what we've done? We've put God way out yonder somewhere far away. Did you hear what Paul said? He said, we're as close as the very breath that we breathe to God. He said, we live and move and have our very being in him. Don't stick God somewhere off out yonder the universe away. He's right here. You know what Jesus said about it, don't you? Matthew 18, verse 1, he says, And where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be in their midst. If the Bible means what it says, and I believe it does, Jesus Christ is just as much here in this assembly as these two little girls sitting back here right now talking to one another. He's close. He's here. You can stick the name up across the building and call it the Church of Christ and it not be the Church of Christ. He's not talking about the name on a certain building when he says where two or three are gathered together in my name. It is upon the authority of Christ, upon his divine instruction. If we meet in his name, on his authority, in his divine instructions, and there's only two or three of us or eight or ten of us or 15 or 20 of us or 200 of us, 
if we meet in that situation, we're close. We're nigh to God. He's here. I need to preach like it. We need to pray like it. We need to recognize the reverence that's supposed to be in the assembly of the church. You see, God's the audience. You're not. We're not the audience. God's the audience. And he's listening. He's picking up on everything that you and I are doing in the worship of the church. Think about our attitudes. And then there's another one, another passage, and I'll close with this one. You remember what? Peter learned by the sheet knit before corners that came down out of heaven. God was telling him that people could be saved from every nationality on earth. Well, as the Jews, first ones who became Christians on Pentecost, the household of Cornelius, but notice the way the Bible states this, Acts 10, 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now you think about that a minute. Who is it in every nation? that is going to be accepted of God. Those that fear him and worketh righteousness. A lot of people don't like this verse. I didn't put it in the Bible. I preached it for many, many years. I'm not going to stop. In John chapter 9, verse 31, Jesus made it clear in this passage of Scripture, take the context, Study it all the way through. It was a blind man that was making the statement, but boy, what a statement he made. And it is in complete agreement with what Christ stood for and everything the worship of the church is all about. The Bible says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But he does hear somebody. You know who it is that he hears? Those that worship him and do his will. That's who God hears. Is God hearing your worship this morning? Are you a sincere seeker of God? Do your prayers stop at the end of your mouth? When you speak them, they don't go any further than the ceiling of this building because you don't fear God and don't do his will in your life. God hears and answers the prayers of people who worship him and do his will. Let me get a little, little bit closer. Is it possible that there's somebody in this building this morning that is a person going through supposedly worshiping God and they don't know God? Is it possible for a person who claims to be a Christian to sit in the assembly of the church and his prayers and his singing and his worship go no further than the walls and the parts of this building? Because there is unconfessed, unrepented of sin that has gone on and nobody has ever told you that your worship becomes in vain because you have open blatant sin in your life and you won't quit it and you won't repent of it and you won't come to God for forgiveness. Brethren, if that's not the truth, I don't know what is. Based on 1 John 1, 7, 8, and 9, James 5, verse 16, the Bible makes it clear that worship is dependent upon a person having their heart right with God and sincerely pouring out their adorations to the God of this universe. Worship of church is a very serious thing. 
separates the men from the boys. You can't do as you please and worship God. You can't go through the motions of the prayers and the singing and the observing of the Lord's Supper and giving and preaching of the gospel. You can't just go through the motions of that for an outward appearance and it'll be all right. Paul told Timothy that there were people who had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. Who is he talking about? People who supposedly are trying to worship God and they're not sincere about it. They're not honest about it. They're not letting God be the audience, not be the reason why they do what they do. Yes, we need to talk about the worship of the church. A lot more can be said. I hope you come to grips with this subject. I hope you realize that when Paul poured out his preaching on Mars Hill, he was dealing with a people who thought they were okay with God. And they weren't okay with they were dead wrong. They were not worshiping God to please him. It wasn't going through to the God of this universe. They were worshiping the wrong object. They weren't worshiping God. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, you haven't obeyed the gospel, you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, there's something in your life that's separating you from God and your worship is not going through and you know it because of your own attitude and lifestyle of what's going on. You don't have to live with yourself. If you can't live with your own conscience, you can't live with your own self, and be sincere before God, then something's wrong. And it needs to be made right. And that's what the worship of the church is all about. Getting things right with God. If your heart's not right, we can help you. We can pray with you. We can teach you further. Let it be known. While we if you have pray. questions or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.